Hi everyone and welcome back to the CTU Newsroom. My name is Madison and today we're joined by Naren from the SABPP. Today we will be discussing HR management, what value does the HR qualification hold and why study the SABPP route. Let's hear more. The name is Naren Vassan from SABPP and the Quality Assurance Manager. My role is to look after the governance of quality and when it comes to qualification both for private and public sector. I think if you really look at it in South Africa, I think we're sitting with huge challenges. For example, leadership. I think if you look at HR and, and leaders in, 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 in South Africa today, are they really applying the good governance process? Are they ethical? We also need to look at things like, are they effective? Are HR and management effective in delivering the services? If I look at succession plan, the question is, we know a lot of staff are coming in and out of the company with age and baby boomers living in the company, who's taking over the job? Is, is someone taking on the new information? Or are we still sitting by saying, okay, they can be retrenched, we'll find someone else. But how are we losing knowledge and skills in the process? I think those are typical examples we need to consider. The other thing is staff retention. People are coming and going out of the companies. There's a trend in South Africa that says that um, graduates don't stay more than two years in a company. So, so what, what is the company doing about it? How do we retain the graduate in the institution? Is it do I have to pay more or do I keep them where they are? I think that's a challenge already for South Africa. Change management. I think if I look at South Africa itself, there's so much of change is happening. How do HR deal with those kind of things? Like um, if I bring a new system, have I got a new product, tools and systems in place? I think that's a reality. So change management becomes an issue. Line managers suddenly make a decision and say we want immediate changes. But is the staff ready? I think that becomes a question. Then we, we are also driven with compliance. We need to make sure that the workplace skills plan is completed, the employment equity documents are in order. So are we more have we become so compliance driven that we're forgetting the real role of HR? Um, the other thing is if we talk about occupational health and safety. We're so busy putting posters up, but we don't look at the safety of its employees. Um, if I look at ergonomics, how are office space being designed? Should we consider that? That's a reality of life. The other last two things I can consider is lack of communication. We also believe that when it comes to information, is it, being properly, is it properly being shared from bottom up, top down? Is the communication message coming through from all the stakeholders? And the last but not least, I find unethical practices becoming a real issue in South Africa. Nepotism, sexual harassment, we talk about bullying, unfair promotions, those are realities of life. Um, having said that, I think we need to then say, if those things are already unethical, can you imagine the court cases that are coming at CCMA? I think if you look at SCBP itself, um, the SABP route follows the simple guidance of saying we are here to guide both the learner and training provider in making sure we give you continuous support. Secondly, we need to say we try and lead the way and don't just become compliance driven. So what does that mean is that we also believe that if we set the exam paper, the final exam paper for the student, we're benchmarking good practices. So whether you get trained by uh, this institution or another institution, the end output is the graduate will be comfortable by saying it's a recognized exam at the end. The another thing I can consider is that from the SCBP route is that we try and be innovative as we move down the line. Being innovative is a way to go because we are saying, do we allow technology blended learning approach? We encourage that. So learning shouldn't just be textbook. Can you bring in webinars? Can you bring in um, e-assessments or e-portfolios? I am saying bring it. And, and the thing is that I don't want to be restrictive by saying a training provider cannot do it. I need to find a way that's going to make it easier both for learners as well as for the training providers. So when we do external moderation, I can say yes, the evidence is relevant and be comfortable with the judgment being made. We're also then saying, if SEBP route is making a big difference for the industry, we're also then saying that do we follow the governance of seeing that the site is compliant? So what we normally do is that we monitor our training providers annually. Now that tells us that when you applied for your original accreditation, you said certain things. We want to monitor and see, are you still doing the same thing? 
Are you doing things the right way? And I think that's critical. Uh, they also then say is that we always keep two things in mind. What about the learner? And we always need to consider that when we do a qualification, it's not about finance only. The learner in mind is more important to me because someone is investing in this youth's development. And whether the learner is an adult or a new student that's unemployed doesn't make a difference. What is good, good, what is good for the learner? What is fairness? And I think if I look at the SABP route, is to be fair and transparent throughout the process. Let's talk about RPL. I think right now in South Africa, we're sitting with huge challenges. We've got people who've been working in the industry for so many years, and they are saying, how can someone recognize that I can demonstrate the required skills? So SABP has adopted the simple philosophy by saying, if a learner wants a full qualification, then the RPL should be based on exit level outcomes of the qualification. So exit level outcomes says that the learner should be able to monitor and track evidence. Now that can be made up of so many different unit standards. I am saying find the content that allows the learner to demonstrate the exit of the qualification. The other challenge of RPL is that while RPL is very much based on exit level outcome of the qualification, we also need to then say, which covers what we say, the fundamentals and the core of the unit standards. The elective part can be designed in a different way by saying, can it be an assignment? Can it be a case study? We allow the flexibility. So for me is to say, the learner will do all the learning that's required by the training provider. But the best way to test the RPL learner is that that same learner will do the same examination like any other learner at the end, which means, when the board sets the exam paper, that's the final test. So the RPL process may be shorter. It might require more learning, more evidence-based. I think that's the challenge. So evidence-based is almost 70%. We need to then consider, how do I test the learner's skills are still there when it comes to knowledge? So we are saying 70% portfolio evidence-based and 30% must be in the form of a knowledge assessment. Knowledge assessment can be done in both by saying, interview the learner by asking questions. They don't have to say A plus B plus C. We are saying, can they say A, B, C? That's important to me. So if I look at RPL, it's a challenge for South Africa. It can work for South Africa. I'm also saying RPL is the way to go for the future because all companies up and until today have people who are employed for umps years, but nobody's awarded them any credit, no qualification. And I do believe that we should embark on RPL Keep it as simple as possible, not tedious. And, and I also believe that if anybody wants to follow that route, they're welcome to come to the institution and say, can we evaluate the tools? I'm prepared to commit that we, if we sign off the tool, the institution can go ahead with it. If I look at the HR qualification, it actually tells the learner and the intended learner that he or she has the underpinning knowledge of performance management how to do induction, how to deal with legislative issues when it comes to recruitment, how they, how, what are the best practices and processes. Um, if I even look at things like how to supervise the processes, it's also important. So the HR qualification gives you a lot of foundational knowledge and functional skills that allow the learner to apply them in the world of work. So we believe within, within our fraternity, if the, not, if the qualification allows you to do multiple things, knowledge, practical and workplace learning is a real test. Where the workplace is done by means of an assignment or a case study, let the learner get exposed to it. Now, to me, a learner doesn't mean has to be employed or unemployed. Let them go and do the real work. That's the real scenario. So the value of HR qualification is to integrate theory, practical and applied. Well, let's look at HR the way going forward. We believe HR should play what we call as a business partner. That's point one. Which means they should be part with management. They need to understand where's the company going, strategy. What are the governance and risk issues that has a direct impact on them? What are the stats I must keep in mind called analytics and measurement that's important? And if I look at that going future, we need to then say HR should understand the business. So business knowledge is not negotiable. So if I want to provide service to, to the institution or the company I work for, the future of HR is to be absorbed as part of the business, understand, 
should be part of EXCO as executive committee to support management in saying, when you're doing X, please consider the human factor, consider the cost factor, but don't forget that technology will be an enabling process. So if technology will be used for tracking, payroll calculations, for, for learning and development, for, for, for anything that allows learner or employees to grow by in the learning space, call it e-learning is fine. But I think if we go, technology should be used as a, an enabling tool. It shouldn't just be there because it's there. But if I look at technology, we must keep in mind social media has become a critical issue because people don't use social media the correct way. So I would understand that all companies should have a technology policy that covers social media, as well as payroll and everything else that covers it. So which means an employee in my mind should sign a compliance document on an annual basis to say, I will ensure that I will not, that I will adhere to other companies' social media policy. So if, if employees sign this document and they go against it, then they are liable. So future of HR, I always believe succession planning is important. Staff retention is important. We also need to ensure that leadership skills become part of the integrated process for the future of HR. As you've heard, studying the SABP period provides continuous support and guidance and encourages innovative ways of delivering learning. If you'd like to study human resource management, visit the link in the description below and also subscribe to receive CTU's latest updates. Thank you for watching. I'm Madison signing out of the CTU Newsroom. See you next time.